What are those people thinking? Nuclear hot seat. What have those boys been drinking? Nuclear hot seat. The corium is sinking. Our time to act is shrinking, but our activists are linking. Nuclear hot seat. It's the bomb. Welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat, the weekly international news magazine keeping you up to date on all things anti-nuclear. My name is Libby Halevi. I'm the producer and host, as well as a survivor of the nuclear accident at Three Mile Island from just one mile away. So I know what can happen when the so-called nuclear experts get it wrong. This week we have three separate features for you. We again get updated on the latest news or lack thereof. On the explosion and radiation leak at the WIP site in Carlsbad, New Mexico, we talk with the ever-reliable Don Hancock of Southwest Information and Resource Center to learn what is and is not being said. Then, Three Mile Island alerts Scott Portsline helps us understand the flawed natures of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission's computer program to analyze potential nuclear reactor accident consequences. This is based on his participation in last week's webinar that was put together by NIRS, Nuclear Information and Resource Service. And in our Voices from Japan series, we learn about the long reach of TEPCO's censorship as it impacted filmmaker Yumiko Hayakawa and her film A Woman from Fukushima about Fukushima refugee and former nuclear hot seat interviewee Setsuko Kita. These interviews, plus numbnuts of the week, and all the rest will be coming up in just a few minutes. Today is Tuesday, July 15, 2014, and here is the week's anti-nuclear news. We'll start by catching up with TEPCO, Tokyo Electric Power Company, the benighted company that has been running Fukushima Daiichi and the rest of us into the ground. On Friday, July 11, TEPCO announced that the cooling system of Reactor 6 spent fuel pool was temporarily suspended for a technical problem. This is in addition to last week's suspended cooling system in Unit 5. Reactor 6 was in the process of removing all fuel assemblies from the reactor to the spent fuel pool in order to centralize the fuels being cooled down. The cooling system was intermittent while they were transferring the fuel. The cause of the suspension was water leakage from the same valve as last week on Unit 5. The Reactor 5 temperature jumped up 13 degrees Celsius, meaning 55.4 degrees Fahrenheit, while losing the coolant system for only two days. TEPCO admitted that if they couldn't reboot the coolant system, the spent fuel pool temperature would have gone over the safety limit in five days. The problems at Fukushima are, of course, not going unnoticed in Japan. Professor Hiroake Kuide, a Kyoto University Reactor Research Incident Professor and a former nuclear hot seat interviewee on our Voices from Japan series, said that the Fukushima plant is now like a swamp of radioactive material due to the contaminated water. He added, TEPCO should quit cooling with water since one year ago. However, from TEPCO's assumption, it is impossible to shift to air cooling because they can't identify the exact locations of the molten fuel. Kowide said, I would build a roof on the entire site. 11,000 tons of contaminated water are in underground trenches connected to the number two and three reactor turbine buildings. Contaminated water began seeping into them after the onset of the March 2011 nuclear crisis. If the contaminated water is not moved from the trenches, it could eventually leak out. Up to 400 tons of radioactive groundwater that flows into the basements each day must be pumped out, stored, and treated, and on-site storage is edging closer to capacity. So that brings us to TEPCO's science fiction plans for an ice fence in the water, in the ocean, around Fukushima Daiichi. Last month, workers began inserting 1,550 pipes into the ground to form a rectangular cordon around the reactors. 
Coolant set at minus 30 degrees Celsius, which is minus 22 degrees Fahrenheit, will be fed into the pipes in the hopes of eventually freezing the surrounding earth to create an impermeable barrier. But what has TEPCO ever done that has gone according to plans? TEPCO officials have now said that the ice walls failed to form because of the constant flow of a maximum 2 milliliters of water per minute around the connecting points. Toyoshi Fuketa, a commissioner with Japan's Nuclear Regulation Authority, which is their version of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission we have here in the States, has instructed TEPCO to come up with steps to resolve the matter by the end of July, arguing that the frozen walls should be able to withstand certain levels of water flow under normal circumstances as though anything at Fukushima is normal. The continued presence of water threatens to prevent the creation of outer frozen soil walls encircling the number one through number four reactors, which are the central part of TEPCO's plans to reduce the amount of contaminated water at the plant. But right now, instead of a series of popsicles holding back the water, they've got a slushy. Dale Klein former head of the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission and a senior advisor to TEPCO, recently told Kyoto News, I'm not convinced the freeze wall is the best option. Oh, now you come up with that. He went on, what I'm concerned about is unintended consequences. Where does that water go? And what are the consequences of that? I think they need more testing and more analysis. No, Dale Klein, what they need is a miracle. Meanwhile, TEPCO is having a hard time holding on to personnel. And can you blame the personnel? Stigma, pay cuts, and the risk of radiation exposure are among the reasons why 3,000 employees have left the utility at the center of Japan's 2011 nuclear disaster. Now there's an additional factor. Better paying jobs in the, ta-da, solar energy industry. About time. Japan's corporate culture holds that people join a company and stay with it for life. The year before the disaster at Fukushima Daiichi began, only 134 people quit TEPCO in the entire year. Those departures ballooned to 465 in 211, 712 in 2012, and 488 last year. 70% of those leaving were younger than 40 meaning they were a major portion of the human resources of the company. When TEPCO offered voluntary retirement for the first time earlier this year, 1,151 workers applied for the 1,000 available packages. One executive who quit TEPCO in 2012 said, no one is going to want to work there if they can help it. Enough about the travails of TEPCO. There are some more human elements that we need to take a look at. Rice paddies located about 20 kilometers, 12 miles from the Fukushima Daiichi plant were found to be contaminated with radioactive cesium that was blowing in the wind. The Fukushima prefectural government revealed that last year's harvested rice from 14 locations in the city of Minamisoma contained more than 100 becquerels of cesium per kilogram. That means it was beyond the government's extremely lenient, if not insanely high, safety quote-unquote limit for contamination. This article says that the contaminated rice has been removed, but no one has said where it has been removed to or what has been done with it. The ministry says cesium was detected on the outside of the husk of the rice. Debris removal work conducted last August on the Unit 3 reactor, may be one of the reasons for the contamination. Now, TEPCO, sorry, we just can't get away from them, TEPCO reportedly told the ministry it will use chemicals to stop dust from spreading during debris removal work this year. Oi. Neither the ministry nor the utility told Minnesota City officials that work in the plant may have contaminated the crop. TEPCO is scheduled to conduct large-scale debris removal work at Unit 1, and for this, it plans to disassemble covers, which had been put there, to prevent the radioactive materials from spreading. Second OI. Now, remember in all of this, 
that the United States allows 12 times the radiation dose per kilogram of food than is allowed in Japan. So it would be perfectly legal for them to sell this contaminated rice to the United States where we would have no labeling, no warning, just a lot of inexpensive rice imported from Japan. As for the so-called decontamination work, Soil removed from the ground in Fukushima for decontamination is starting to break out of the bags. We reported on this last week on Nuclear Hot Seat. Now we have pictures that the bags are severely deteriorated already because of putrefaction gas from the soil, and now they are sprouting. That's right. Plants are growing from inside the bags, splitting them open as they reach for the sun. We will have a picture up on our website, nuclearhotseat.com slash blog, under this episode, number 160. Oh, and by the way, the government of Japan has not announced any measures to properly preserve the increasing amounts of soil that have been gathered together in plastic bags for decontamination. But even with radioactive rice and sprouts splitting the bags of radioactive soil... What's the government of Japan planning to do? It is planning to lift an evacuation order on part of Fukushima Prefecture within 20 kilometers, that's 12 miles, from the crippled Fukushima nuclear disaster. The evacuation order that is planned to be lifted is for the eastern part of Kawauchi Village. So are the residents thrilled to be going back home again? Heck no! Many residents are demanding that this lifting of the evacuation order be postponed. In fact, 80% of the residents of this district have filed a six-point request with the Kawauchi Village Office demanding that decontamination work be redone and the lifting of the evacuation order be postponed. We'll let you know what happens. The Asahi Shimbun has recently obtained a copy of the transcripts of testimony given before a government investigation panel by the late Masao Yoshida. Yoshida served as general manager of the Fukushima nuclear power plant and was in charge on March 11, 2011, when first the earthquake and then the tsunami hit the plant. He is one of the few genuine heroes of the TEPCO Fukushima saga, as he stayed behind and encouraged 50 of his workers to stay with him, the Fukushima 50, who battled the disaster in its early stages and are most likely responsible for the nuclear disaster not being even worse than it is. The document remains the only available official transcript of the testimony by Yoshida, the on-site commander of efforts to bring the situation under control. He died in July of 2013 of esophageal cancer without having disclosed much to media organizations about the accident at the plant. While most interviewees were questioned on average for only slightly less than two hours, Yoshida was interviewed for more than 28 hours, which amounts to 400 pages of testimony. He was asked to respond on how he acted and what he thought at decisive moments. The emotionally open nature of his responses throughout the report indicates that, as a whole, Yoshida recounted what he really thought and felt. Some passages in the report show him furious, as when he referred to Naoto Kan, then Prime Minister of Japan, as that guy. The transcript has not been released publicly at Yoshida's request. One can only hope that for the sake of history and for us understanding more, that it will be. There is a great article by Harvey Wasserman that is again doing the rounds on Facebook. The article is from February 2 of this year from ecowatch.com, but it deserves another look because it hasn't gotten old. 50 Reasons Why We Should Fear the Worst from Fukushima. I will, of course, be posting a link up on the website, but a few of the points that really came across to me this time were number 12. When the Atomic Energy Commission's chief medical officer, Dr. John Goffman, urged that reactor dose levels be lowered by 90%, 
He was forced out of the AEC and publicly attacked, despite his status as a founder of the industry. Number 21. Fukushima's ongoing fallout is already far in excess of that from Chernobyl, which was far in excess of that from Three Mile Island. Number 25. Key lowball Chernobyl death estimates come from the World Health Organization, whose numbers are overseen by the International Atomic Energy Agency, a United Nations organization chartered to promote the nuclear industry. We'll be hearing more about the International Atomic Energy Agency, or IAEA, in a few moments. And number 49 and 50, both by Admiral Hyman Rickover, father of the nuclear navy. Rickover warned that it is a form of suicide to raise radiation levels within Earth's vital envelope, and that if he could, he would sink all the reactors he helped develop. In 1982, Rickover said, Now, when we go back to using nuclear power, I think the human race is going to wreck itself. And it is important that we get control of this horrible force and try to eliminate it. That's what the father of the nuclear navy had to say about radiation levels. So what does the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency say? They're saying, wow, let's raise those levels. They're way too low. And they're interfering with America's economy. The EPA is kindly giving those of us who they call receptors, not people, receptors, until August 3rd to tell them if and how they should change the radiation standards for the nuclear power fuel chain. Fukushima Fallout Awareness Network on Facebook posted a great rebuttal to the EPA's proposed change in standards that was written by Diane DeRico of NEARS. Diane wrote, Radiation standards have always been used to protect the polluter from liability for the damage from the pollution being released and to which people, they call us receptors, isn't that special, to which people are exposed. The U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA, has a policy of limiting pollutants to a risk range of 1 in a million to 1 in 10,000 people getting cancer from the pollutant. Current allowable exposure of 25 millirem per year from each nuclear fuel chain facility is a risk of 1 in 500, and the EPA is considering changing its regulations. It wants to update how it calculates doses. The changes could make it legal for nuclear power fuel chain facilities to release more radioactivity without admitting that is what they are doing. The perspective of NEARS is that EPA regulation should address the most vulnerable stages of life. According to available data, young females are at the greatest risk from ionizing radiation, so we are calling for limits to be set based on limiting their, or our, risks at that stage of life. The EPA needs to incorporate a non-cancer hazard index for non-cancer health effects from radiation. No increases in allowable contamination above what is currently the rule, and do not set new water standards for nuclear facilities. And even in doing all of this, Diane wants us to remember that the first lie is that regulations protect people. The deadline for comments is August 3rd, and we will have a link to the EPA site where you can place your comments at nuclearhotseat.com under this episode number 160160. Last week, the Nuclear Information and Resource Services, or NEARS, along with Three Mile Island Alert, held a webinar to expose the latest nuclear accident study as being faulty. The study, known as SORCA, standing for State of the Art Reactor Consequences Analysis, has been accredited by the NRC. Scott Portsline is a member of Three Mile Island Alert and a regular contributor to Nuclear Hot Seat. We spoke with him about the SORCA program. First, Scott, what is SORCA? 
Sorker is a type of probabilistic risk analysis used by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission to examine the consequences of nuclear accidents. It's the same type of study which gave us the line used in the movie The China Syndrome, and that line was that a severe accident could render an area the size of the state of Pennsylvania uninhabitable. The designation state-of-the-art primarily refers to a computer program created at the Sandia National Laboratories, which was used to run the simulations. Sorka used data from the Peach Bottom plant here in Pennsylvania and the Surrey, Virginia plant to create the accident scenarios. Scott, you say that Sorka is defective. What's wrong with it? Well, there are many reasons, but the primary reason is that the study was manipulated and rigged. This was done by cherry-picking data and limiting accident scenarios to one where radioactive releases were delayed and smaller than in previous studies. In fact, I have an internal email from the Nuclear Energy Institute suggesting that the scenarios be limited to ones where the containment building remains intact. This would mean that just about anything that went wrong inside the plant, as long as containment was not breached, then no one was harmed. And this was the results the industry was seeking. When Niels Diaz was chairman of the NRC, he had this to say about what became the Sorka study. Even if worst case things happen, we have plenty of time to protect the people of this country. So what I'm saying flat out is that there are no quick mechanism for significant releases of radioactivity that we have identified. In all cases, there is time to protect the American people. And that's the answer that we needed. That's the answer that we have. Of course, that statement about no quick mechanisms for significant releases is far from the truth. And one of the reasons Sorka did not examine earthquakes, fires, and aircraft crash scenarios. But that last line indicates that the agenda of Sorka was actually to provide the favorable conclusions which the NRC needed. The problem is, there has never been a timely evacuation order, let alone a timely evacuation at any of the world's nuclear accidents. How accurate are the computer renderings of the scenarios? They are more unreliable than a polygraph, you know, a lie detector test. First of all, the Melcor software, that's the name given to the computer coding, M-E-L-C-O-R-E, didn't meet the U.S. Department of Energy's quality assurance standards for safety software. Secondly, Surka fails to mention that the software can easily create divergent results. And the Los Alamos National Laboratory says that the new codes are more complex and more ambitious, but not as closely coupled to experiments and theory as they need to be. It also said that, quote, experimental and theoretical science are mature methodologies, but computational science is not. And the third point is, the software is not able on its own to simulate or predict any of the world's nuclear accidents. In fact, the Sandia National Laboratories used Three Mile Island as an example. It said that the ability to use a computer code such as Melkor for prediction of severe accident progression is best early in the accident and then becomes progressively less certain later in the accident. This is the result of the accumulation of error and uncertainty. Sandia noted that when running the TMI scenario, Quote, without the known correct answer of plant data from the accident, it would be easy to generate different consequences ranging from minimal to a highly damaged core, end quote. And that's one of my criticisms of Sorka. It did not take into account some of the very events which occurred at Three Mile Island, allowing for the early transport of radioactive materials outside of the containment building. Therefore, the conclusions of Sorka that there will be time to evacuate are bogus. And this state-of-the-art idea is very misleading because computers actually introduce more errors than the prior studies. What did Sorka conclude about cancers and leukemias? They said that a very, very small number of latent cancers would occur compared to tens of thousands in the previous studies. Sorka examined the immediate deaths and examined latent cancer deaths of people if they returned to the afflicted area. And this is an odd way to measure the severity of a nuclear accident. The only yardstick used by Sorka was deaths. What conclusions did Sorka come to about economic loss? They did not examine that nor did they look at environmental or land contamination. What do you think will become of this study? 
I think we will be able to force the NRC to discredit this study and drop it, as it did for another study. And that was the one they dropped two months prior to the Three Mile Island accident, known as the Rasmussen Report, the one that said an area the size of the state of Pennsylvania could be rendered uninhabitable. In fact, in January, January 18, 1979, the NRC issued a policy statement saying that they withdrew an explicit or implicit past endorsement of that study. So, I think we can see the same thing happen here. Scott Portsline of Three Mile Island Alert. To get a copy of the documents to which Scott was referring, you can Google Slide Share Sorca, S-O-A-R-C-A, or you can download a PDF at a link that we will have up on the website. Operators of the Oyster Creek Nuclear Reactor in Ocean County, New Jersey, only 80 miles outside of Manhattan, shut down the power plant to check and possibly replace five safety valves, plant officials said on July 8th. The shutdown was prompted by an inspection of previously removed valves, which showed unexpected wear on two of them and could have caused them to fail. This according to plant owner Exelon and the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission. It's not known how long the plant will remain offline. Could we try for forever? The potential problem began in late June during a maintenance inspection of the valves. NRC officials said that raised a red flag with nuclear critics, who questioned why a plant shutdown was not required sooner by the NRC. Arnie Gunderson of Fairwinds Energy Education and Fairwinds Associate, an independent nuclear analyst, said, The valves are designed so you can do without one, You can possibly do without two. But that's the question. When did they know the two valves were inoperable, and when did they decide to shut down? All five of the currently installed valves were conservatively declared inoperable. Gunderson said he wonders why the shutdown did not happen sooner. Were they waiting for parts, he asked, possibly rhetorically. Technically, the indications that the valves could have a problem should initiate what's called a limiting condition of operation that needs to be resolved soon under NRC rules, Gunderson said. Janet Toro of the local group Grandmothers, Mothers, and More for Energy Safety have pushed for Oyster Creek to install filtered vents to control discharges during emergencies. But Gunderson said the economics of building improved vents won't work for the plant in Lacey. He said, Oyster Creek will shut down before they would install them. Okay, so what's the problem? Shut it down. Only the Indian Point nuclear reactor in Long Island is closer to Manhattan and a larger risk to Manhattan. So shut that one down too. Word went out from a government report last week that regarding the WIP plutonium release at the deep repository in Carlsbad, New Mexico, nuclear waste got up to 1,600 degrees Fahrenheit during the accident that happened on February 14. We will have more about this during our featured interview with nuclear watchdog and WIP expert Don Hancock. In Israel, on Wednesday, July 9, Hamas fired three rockets from the Gaza Strip into Dimona, a southern city where Israel's nuclear reactor is located. While the rockets caused no injury or damage, it's the first time that rockets have hit Dimona, which is one of Israel's most sensitive areas. This raises the specter of recent attacks on nuclear reactors in Ukraine. So for all those countries currently being courted and convinced to go nuclear rah-rah, they need to realize that the threat this poses at some future date is very real and could be devastating. You think they'll pay attention? Nah. That would require that each country's leadership would be sane. And speaking of insane, it's time for this week's Nuclear Hot Seat, Nuclear Hot Seat, Nuclear Hot Seat, None that sound a week. Well, put on a funny hat and let's have a party. 
the International Atomic Energy Agency, the IAEA, that that pro-nuclear group that put a sock in the World Health Organization when it came to saying anything against nuclear, is celebrating almost 50 years of working with the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. Woohoo! The IAEA is touting the fact that they have been using hashtag nuclear technology to address issues related to food safety, animal production, and incest pest control. That's right, if there's a pest, let's just nuke them. When it comes to food safety and nuclear, what could be a better combination? And animal protection? Just talk to all of those animals in the process of species collapse in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. Now these two United Nations-based organizations are working in strengthening their partnership as they focus on climate change. Whether it's to cause it or prevent it is anybody's guess. So here's the fun part. The IAEA is asking, What challenge do you think our partnership is best suited to tackle? Let us know as a commentary below. We will give you a link to where you can find that below, and I suggest you figure out a party of your own so that you can give them the best possible answer that they deserve. And that's why the International Atomic Energy Agency and the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization with their love match of 50 years is this week's Nuclear Hot Seed, none that sound a week. We'll have our interview about the WIP site in Carlsbad, New Mexico, as well as our voices from Japan in just a moment. But first, hey, Nuclear Hot Seat relies on your support to keep bringing you the anti-nuclear news every week. Donations are needed to cover bandwidth charges, website security, travel expenses to cover stories, web hosting, and so much more. If you haven't yet donated, or if you'd like to help out again, just go to NuclearHotSeat.com, the homepage, scroll down, find that big red Donate button, and click it. Your assistance will go directly to helping me help you keep up to date on all things anti-nuclear. Whatever you can do to help, many thanks. This week, we again spoke with Don Hancock, Director of Southwest Research and Information Center in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and a nuclear watchdog, if not bulldog. Don has been following events at the Waste Isolation Pilot Plant, or WIP site, since way before it opened 15 years ago. He's been a great source for Nuclear Hot Seat on exactly what we know and don't know about the February 14 underground explosion and radiation leak that threw americium and plutonium into the environment. This week, Don again brings us up to speed with some new information on how any of us can go online and participate in the Carlsbad, New Mexico town hall meetings on this unresolved nuclear incident. Don, bring us up to date on what is known regarding the accident at the WIP site. Well, we don't really know much more now than we knew a month ago or two months ago or three months ago. We still don't know what the cause was. We still don't know what caused some of the radioactivity to be propelled a mile uh, underground and up the shaft, which is a mile and then six-tenths of a mile away. We don't know what caused the release or releases to happen. We don't even know how many containers were involved. There's been one container found to be breached, but DOE and their contractor are spending a lot of time, effort, and money to try to get the cameras to go through the entire room to look as well as they can at all 258 containers because even they aren't sure that the one container that they do have pictures of is the only one that's breached, etc. So all of the major things that we need to know, we still don't know five months after the event. Los Alamos said that in the waste stream that there were 55 containers that contained nitrate salts as an oxidizer mixed with the suspect kitty litter. How many of those containers are still on site at WIP? 
Well, all of them that were sent to WIP are still on site at WIP. They're all in the underground, both in this room seven, panel seven, where the release, where the high radiation readings have been detected, and some of them are in panel six, rooms one and two, which are are next door. There are also some suspect drums that are at waste control specialists in Texas. So this problem is not just limited to Los Alamos or WIP. It also includes WCS. But I guess the other thing to just remind people of is that they still haven't been able to determine and actually replicate that any of these most suspect drums are actually what did explode and cause the release. That continues to be the leading theory, but that has not actually been proven yet. So, again, that's one of the other many things that we don't know. One of the reports I read said that based solely on the photographic information, it appears that some surfaces on the Los Alamos may have reached temperatures of just under 1,600 degrees Fahrenheit, and that the waste in a large portion of the room reached temperatures up to 446 degrees Fahrenheit. What are the dangers of those kind of temperatures? Well, obviously, if there are people there, that's very dangerous because those kind of temperatures would cause major health problems and potentially, depending on the location that the person is and how they were located, et cetera, would cause serious injury or even death. So that's very hot. So it's dangerous that way. One of the reasons that there are limits that are supposed to be achieved in terms of the kind of materials that are in any of the whip waste is to try to avoid a situation where you're in a lot of heat and that creates a problem in the the waste. These are very high temperatures. They, again, like Lots of other things, WIP was never supposed to have that kind of high a temperature in the underground. We don't know what happened to cause that those high a temperatures, and we don't really know how the various containers and the waste in the containers reacted to it. We do know that the bags of the magnesium oxide were pretty well dissolved, and so the magnesium oxide from lots of pictures is kind of scattered all over the place. But again, we don't know because none of these, none of the containers, none of the waste, the magnesium oxide, none had gone through any kind of testing of exactly what happens when you're at such high temperatures because, again, such high temperatures weren't supposed to exist. As to the waste drums that are at WCS in Andrews, Texas, that is a facility that provides above-ground storage as opposed to the deep repository at WIP. What, if any, additional steps have been taken to protect them or protect us from them? You are correct insofar as it relates to storage of the kind of transuranic waste that came from Los Alamos to WCS, although the the major activity that WCS does is to put so-called low-level waste into shallow land burial, uh, uh, several feet underground and then a few feet of dirt on top. So you are correct, none of that is deep geologic repository like WIP, but Most of the waste at WCS is normally in this shallow land burial. So the waste that came from Los Alamos was supposed to be in a storage building on the surface, and that's where it was originally put. My understanding is, and there's not full disclosure of exactly what's going on at WCS, but multiple sources have said that the most suspect drums from Los Alamos have been taken out of this building where the waste originally was, has been put in a concrete container to, again, sort of like a blast container to contain the waste if there was some further kind of release. And then it's actually been put below ground, apparently and hopefully in some retrievable form, And the argument for putting it underground is both to keep the temperature lower, the physical temperature lower, because it's pretty hot in West Texas this time of year, and to provide additional protection in case there was some sort of release. We've been told that there are a variety of protective measures, like what I've described, that have been taken at WCS. There hasn't been a full 
public disclosure that I'm aware of of exactly what is happening to each of the containers from Los Alamos to the WCS. How are the workers doing? And has there been any discussion in the community or for the workers about the difference between internal and external radiation contamination and how internal contamination, as has been confirmed for those 22 workers, is more dangerous to their health? DOE and Nuclear Waste Partnership, the contractor, have taken the position that they don't, the workers don't need to have any further testing done because they calculate that they receive less than 10 milliram internal dose. They don't need any treatment. They, you know, aren't going to suffer any health effects. The site managers also confirmed to me that the health insurance that those 22 workers have does not cover them having any kind of a second opinion about the exposure they receive. So if any of the workers are actually getting any treatment or any further analysis, they're paying for it themselves because DOE and the contract and the health insurance isn't paying for it. So all of those are bad things. We don't know. We haven't heard from those 22 workers publicly. For the first time last Thursday evening at the Carlsbad Town Hall meetings that happen every two weeks now, there were three workers who were introduced as being two national and one local steel worker union representative that represents some of the workers at WIP. And one of the few things they said, they were asked some questions and they did respond. So the union representative said they still haven't even received all the data that they ask DOE and the contractor to provide them about the exposures and, as they put it, the false positives and the false negatives that, in theory, you know, they've been told about. So that tells me a couple of things. That tells me that there are still are workers that are concerned about the health situation, and it confirms something that's really bad that DOE and the contractors aren't even making all of the information they have available to the workers. So that's the 22 workers. Remember that additional workers are in very hazardous situation that they're wearing self-breathing apparatus and protective equipment when they, for example, changed out the contaminated filters on the surface that captured a lot of the radioactivity. When they go into the underground to take pictures and just try to find out what's going on and to take samples that then get analyzed of the levels of contamination in different parts of the underground So 22 workers have been exposed. We don't really know how they're doing from their own perspective, but those are not the only workers who have been at risk and are going to be continuing to be at risk because there is a very significant amount of contamination in the underground. So anytime anybody goes underground, they can be subjected to a significant amount of radioactivity, and that's reality, unfortunately. Regarding the town hall meetings, how forthcoming has the information been? Has there been any sense that new information is there, or do you feel that they're a holding pattern to try and keep people feeling like they're getting information when they're not? I am not satisfied with it. I had a conversation with Jose Franco, the website manager, last Wednesday and the town hall meeting was on Thursday, and I expressed to him not only about the town hall but other other uh, situations in terms of what's being made available on the website and otherwise that not enough information was being made available in a timely fashion. It's interesting if you are participating in the town hall meetings that Mr. Franco sometimes adds additional information to what the contractor representatives say, which sort of is a pretty public indication that he's not always satisfied with what's being disclosed at the town hall meeting, which, again, is not, for me, saying that everything that should be disclosed is being disclosed. I think that the format is difficult at those meetings because you have a presentation and then people are allowed to ask questions, and insofar as either the questions aren't clear or are perceived not to be clear, sometimes the answers aren't really on point. A lot of the questions don't even get asked. 
both from the audience and especially the online people who ask questions. They're generally not an opportunity at all or a very good opportunity for follow-up. So, you know, unfortunately, we still have this situation of a lot of information that people should know about isn't being made available at all or in a timely manner. The town halls are now down to twice a month. When they started, they were once a week. When they started, they typically were for 90 minutes. They're now every two weeks and for an hour. So clearly there is less... (laughs) There is less frequent information and less time being given to provide information in those forums. And are they still well attended? See, that's a little hard to tell since I'm not physically there and I'm only watching it online. We've been told, people have asked, we've been told that generally the attendance, there's still a number of people who are there, but the number of people in attendance in the last three or four has is less than what had been in the earlier meetings, although the number of people watching online still seems to be several dozen at least. So the attendance may be dropping some, but locally there is still interest in people watching online. I think it's clearly the case that some people get frustrated at those meetings when they don't feel like, as you indicated earlier, they don't feel like they're getting all the information that they should be getting or that they're asking for. So, you know, that's a continuing problem. I continue to be an advocate for the town hall meetings to continue to happen as opposed to being terminated because some amount of information comes out there, but we still need, and as I say, I've said this to the site manager as recently as last Wednesday, we still need to come up with better mechanisms to get information out. Could you provide me with a link to the online presentations if people outside of the Carlsbad area can watch? The answer is I can do that, and if people want to, they all, there is an audio archive of all the ones that have happened in the past, too. So you can see them live when they're on, and you can see them after the fact, and that is actually on the DOE website. Those are still available. So we could also submit questions if we're watching live online. Yes. Yes, you can. That doesn't mean that all the questions that are asked online or submitted online are actually asked. And while they tend to say questions that don't get asked, there will be written answers provided that has, in fact, not always been the case. Don Hancock, Director of Southwest Research and Information Center in Albuquerque, New Mexico. The next WIP Town Hall meeting will be held on Thursday, July 24 from 5.30 to 6.30 p.m. Mountain Time. After that, it's held on the first and third Thursdays of the month. You can watch it being live-streamed and also take a look at past archives of the meetings. Both links will be up on the website, nuclearhotseat.com slash blog, under episode 160. That's 160. For a different perspective on the nuclear issue, check out my new ebook. Yes, I Glow in the Dark, one mile from Three Mile Island to Fukushima and beyond. It covers what it means in human terms, in receptor terms, to finding oneself only one mile away from a nuclear reactor meltdown while it is happening. It's available as an e-book on Amazon Kindle for about the same as the cost of a cup of Starbucks, and much more politically incorrect. This week we present another in the Nuclear Hot Seat ongoing series, Voices from Japan. Direct statements by individuals in that country who have information they need to get out and have had difficulty doing so. Yumiko Hayakawa graduated from Saike University in Japan and the London School of Journalism in the UK. She began her filmmaking career in 2009, concentrating on peace activism and social justice issues. She won the New Face Award 2009 from the Japanese Congress of Journalists and the Sky Perfect IDEHA Prize at the Yamagata International Documentary Film Festival in 2011. Her film, A Woman from Fukushima, about anti-nuclear activist Setsuko Kita, was recently a selection at the Uranium Film Festival in Rio de Janeiro. Hello, 
I'm Yumiko Hayakawa. The Great East Japan earthquake of three years ago was a big shock for me. The blatant lies of the government, the mass media's parroting of the government position, the priority given to the economy rather than citizens' lives, it was all very shocking. But what has been more disturbing than the government's untruths and the media's disregard is the Japanese citizens' lack of anger about the situation and their it-can't-be-helped attitude. The majority of Japanese feel that if things are okay in the present and their own situation, then all is well. That's their attitude. This is evidenced by the low turnout in the recent Tokyo gubernatorial election, where nuclear power was a top issue being debated. It seems that not only politicians, but also ordinary people only care about the economy. People from other countries must look at us Japanese, saddled with the Fukushima Daiichi accident, which still hasn't been resolved, and wonder why we seem so unconcerned about the problem. I think it is a desperate situation. On the other hand, there are many people who have started to take interest in social issues because of the nuclear accident and the disaster. People who have never gone to demonstrations before are now participating and bringing their kids along. Even if they don't have a video camera, they record the events on their smartphones and share the information on social media. It's encouraging that more and more people have started to take up this hobby. I think the energy behind this kind of activity is a unique kind of power that will help us change the situation. Rather than relying on the mass media, they create and broadcast their own personal media. I am a professional film director, and to help these people, I hold simple video camera and editing workshops. In reporting, the most important things are not special equipment and techniques, but rather a conscience and a willingness to act. If you have that, then your message will be powerful. I think that Japan's mass media is lacking a conscience or any motivation to act. I started to record demonstrations in various places after the disaster. About one year ago, I met Setsuko Kida, an evacuee from Tomioka. I heard that she was a guest on Nuclear Hot Seat before, so many people already know who she is. Even though people who lived closest to the nuclear power plant are the victims who have suffered the most, they are unable to raise their voices. Kida-san is a valuable asset to the movement since she is able to speak publicly about herself and her family and express her anger toward the government and TEPCO. I followed Kida-san around for about a year and recently finished making the documentary A Woman from Fukushima. Through Kida-san's story, I have tried to illustrate how Japan's social structure has supported the nuclear industry as well as emphasize the importance of raising our voices. I would like people around the world to see the film, and I have subtitled it in English. I would be happy if you could watch my film. I have had many private screenings, but haven't screened it in a public venue yet. One of the reasons is that there are many theaters that are subsidiaries of TEPCO and will not screen any films related to the nuclear accident. One place happened to be a pro-nuclear parliament member's district, and the film was refused. I was told to screen another one of my films that didn't have anything to do with a nuclear issue. The will of the nuclear village and TEPCO has invaded the deepest corners of our lives and relationships. It seems like the theaters think it's safer not to screen my film just in case someone complains. No one wants to make waves, and this results in self-imposed control. We are strangling ourselves by worrying that the government might attempt to censor us before we even try to speak out. As someone working in the media, 
as a documentary filmmaker, I am very concerned about this trend. To resist this situation, we have to create an atmosphere where people feel safe speaking out. People should think, if we hit an obstacle, we should deal with it then. If we are pressured, then we should object. If there is a problem, we have friends to help us. I think the most important thing is to foster an environment in which people can feel like this and keep on expressing themselves. I want to work with people overseas to help resolve the problems in Fukushima and make sure that we don't cause another Fukushima somewhere else. Thank you for the opportunity to speak on this program. Filmmaker Yumiko Hayakawa. Voices from Japan posts in both English and Japanese versions on our website, nuclearhotseat.com, this time under episode number 160. Here's today's final thought. Remember the movie Groundhog Day? That's the one where Bill Murray plays a weatherman sent to cover the Groundhog Day ceremony in Puxatawney, Pennsylvania, to see if the groundhog will see his shadow be scared and winter will go on even longer. Murray keeps waking up to every day being the start of the exact same Groundhog Day, over and over and over again. Now, no one else is aware of this loop in the time-space continuum. They only live the day once, but he lives it thousands of times, each time getting to make choices about what he does, what he says, how he responds to other people. In the course of this endless repetition, he finally gets the day right. And that's when it's the next day for real and he gets to leave as a better person with more kindness and wisdom in his heart and, oh yeah, the girl. In putting nuclear hot seat together week after week, I've started to feel as if I'm stuck in a nuclear groundhog day. The players are the same. The manipulation is the same. The NRC and the EPA are in league with the nuclear industry. The IAEA claims the high ground it doesn't deserve, posing as a nuclear good guy as it stifles the World Health Organization from telling the truth about radiation health impact. Fukushima keeps leaking. TACO keeps lying. And we activists keep jumping up and down screaming, Pay attention! This is important! As nobody does. It can and has been disheartening. Now, I'm good at producing reports for Nuclear Hot Seat or writing on Facebook and elsewhere as if I'm happy with my sarcasms or witty observations or insightful responses, but in truth, some days I wish I could join the mindless, ignorant crowds, say the heck with it, and pretend that nothing nuclear exists. Do you relate? Then, of course, I get a good night's sleep, remember to take my adrenal supplements, get an email with good news or an unexpected donation to the show. Or maybe, just maybe, we win one incremental victory in our battle against all things nuclear. Or maybe I just finish one of these shows and think, wow, that wasn't so bad at all. And I take heart and gird my loins to do it all over again next week and the week after that and the week after that. Groundhog Day. But hey, he not only got through it all, he got the girl and a great new perspective on life. The rest of us should only be so lucky. This has been Nuclear Hot Seat for Tuesday, July 15, 2014. Material for this week's program has been researched and compiled from enenews.com, our friend Iori Mochizuki and his blog Fukushima Diary, Asahi Shimbun, The Guardian, AP, NHK, Manichi, Nears.org, Fairwinds Energy Education and Arnie Gunderson, the EPA, JinHuzNet.com, the IAEA, Harvey Wasserman and EcoWatch.com, and the ever-vigilant Nuclear Hot Seat Facebook community. If you haven't yet, please friend us. Voices from Japan is a co-production of Nuclear Hot Seat and the Families for Safe Energy team. My esteemed co-producer for the series is Beverly Findlay Kaneko. This week's English voiceover artist was Alpha Takahashi. Theme music written by me, sung by Marilee Weber. Nuclear Hot Seat is syndicated by UCY-TV and AirProgressive.com. Our archive is available on iTunes. You can subscribe under podcasts to get it. Or find us on the newly searchable website, NuclearHotSeat.com. 
Nuclear Hot Seat is the activist voice on nuclear issues, so if you have a story lead, a hot tip, or a suggestion of someone to interview, send an email to info at nuclearhotseat.com. We are copyright 2014, Lee B. Halevi and Hardestry Communications. All rights reserved, but fair use allowed. You have my permission to reuse this material as long as proper attribution, website, and email are included. This is Lee B. Halevi of Hardestry Communications, the heart of the art of communicating, reminding you that we've all had our nuclear wake-up call.